My name is Robert Lind. I'm the Director of Engineering at CLG Aerospace. Uh, we're in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we were formed in 2008. We're uh, an engineering services company uh, uh, focusing on uh, whole airplane analysis, uh, flight sciences, uh, st stress and design, uh, loads, aerodynamics, flutter, CFD, performance, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, I've, I've been here since the start. I've had, uh, as Paul says, 25 years now out of school uh, uh, working in aeroelasticity and flight dynamics and aerodynamic design. Now, we use uh, MSC Nastran as the core for uh, most of the work that we do here. Uh, and we have a, a lot of processes in front of and behind Nastran for organizing our data and, uh, and putting the results in the formats we're looking for. But the fundamentals of the aeroelastic calculations that we do are, are uh, with MSC Nastran uh, COPS product. So uh, it's, it's always nice to talk about what, how that works and what we do with that. Uh, so today I have, uh, I think, about 35, maybe 36 slides all together here uh, that I think are going to take about that much time in, in minutes to, to go through and talk through and then have some time for discussion. And here's basically what the outline is. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how aeroelasticity shows up in the civil certification requirements, uh, what kind of uh, analysis cycles and the fidelity uh, result from that, uh, how uh, those different models uh, get changed as the fidelity of the data changes, which is really one of the fundamental things that, that happens in a real-world certification program. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some, some different representative programs, not by uh, actual client name and project, but more generically, and the, the kind of data that gets used to do that work. Uh, there are some uh, nice uh, MSC capabilities that we think are particularly useful for the work we do that I'll highlight on in. And I'm going to talk some more about uh, uh, how you validate and certify these results and uh, a flight test as well, uh, a little bit about how you do some of that flight test. So to start with, and uh, the elastic aspect, excuse me, I just realized I want to move my phone a little bit. Hopefully you can all still hear me OK. Somebody let me know if you can. Um, you know, overall, the requirements for uh, civil safety are really based on accurate or conservative data. The FAA requirements are really uh, safety-based, and performance metrics come into play only when they affect safety. Uh, they're not really, from the FAA's point of concern, concerned about how economical your airplane is. That's really for the, for the airlines or other customers to, to be concerned with, as opposed to maybe a military mission where the mission is more critical sometimes than other aspects. Here, really, it is all about safety, and you've got to show that the data you you use to, to show your results are working, um, you know, are validated by some kind of test or some kind of data. Uh, the regulations tend to be pretty similar around the world. There are some, uh, some differences. This, this presentation doesn't really highlight those, uh, but for the most part, there are fairly similar uh, between FAA, AFA, CAA, other places like that. And this is interesting, too. We're seeing more and more uh, in defense programs that uh, civil requirements get used for the non-combat type mission. So if you have a transport airplane, if you have a sensor carrying airplane that's going to, you know, peer down from above and that sort of thing, uh, it's more and more common for the, even in the military system, for them to use the civil requirements for that. Um, moving on a little more to the specific FAA requirements, this is the only slide I have that actually has uh, FAA regulations on it. You know, obviously there's a whole section on uh, the loads the airplane has to be designed to for strength and on the design requirements for uh, achieving that kind of design. Uh, but the very specific aeroelasticity parts come in in, in two basic places. Um, one is uh, the beginning of the load section, uh, 25.301 and for the transport airplanes, 23 for the small airplanes. I put these up from the FAA rules, the EASA rules, and these particular areas are identical and pretty similar around the world as well. So the loads have to be distributed to be conservatively approximate or to closely represent actual conditions. That's exactly where everybody gets the words accurate or conservative that you might hear that a lot. And uh, when you have your method to determine how those loads work, they have to be validated by flight load measurement. Uh, there are a few uh, caveats about how that's done that I've left out of here, but that's the basic uh, bottom line rule. And then the, the main rule for aeroelasticity is this part C that says, if the deflections under load significantly change that load, then you have to take that into account. You know, if you had a rigid airplane, and airplanes all were rigid enough at one point to not even worry about that change, then obviously you wouldn't even have any aeroelasticity. But 
this, this sentence here is really what drives that requirement uh, because the real airplane really does deflect in a way all airplanes today in a way that changes the result, then you have to make that work. And uh, for the aeroelastic stability requirements, you can see it, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the flutter uh, paragraph, which has been renamed aeroelastic stability to be a little more comprehensive. And again, you have to show the, the, the stability of the airplane that you're not going to have any, any dangerous uh, or, or any other non-required flutter anywhere through the flight envelope, and including doing a full-scale flutter test all the way up to a, a design dive speed, which is an overspeed margin over the, over the uh, regular speed. So if I move along here, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a flight envelope because it comes up a little later on. Uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, let me just spend a minute here. Uh, so here's the plot. Uh, this has been uh, uh, showing an equivalent airspeed, which is dynamic pressure airspeed, uh, one axis, the altitude on the other, so a pretty standard way of representing airspeed and height. And you can see there's a design cruise speed that the airplane is designed for. Typically, there's a, a limiting speed going up with altitude until some maximum Mach number is reached up to the ceiling. And then the airplane operating speed can't exceed this speed, the actual one that goes in the flight manual. And so uh, if you envision this area, and you see it doesn't quite go to zero, just to show more detail on the plot, but this is the area the airplane operates in. And then in terms of designing the airplane, there's a higher speed that gets designed to, a so-called dive speed, out to here, which again in the simplest form is usually a single speed and a single Mach number. Oftentimes there's a whole array of speeds, especially maybe to make this corner smaller, depending on any individual airplane. And this provides protection from the case of an over or an upset. If the airplane is operating at the maximum speed and something happens to upset the airplane, there's a specific requirement for a, a margin for overspeed to get built into the design here. And in the structure side, this is the whole envelope that the airplane gets designed to. Um, for uh, the flutter analysis, uh, you have to analyze out the flutter to a higher speed, which in the uh, transport rules is 1.15 VD MD, and in the slower airplanes is still 1.2, so a 15 or 20 percent margin in speed, which comes out to be a 40 to 45 percent margin in dynamic pressure. And you have to show the airplane free from flutter by analysis in the basic condition after this expanded envelope. And the idea there is that you're going to show by flight test that the airplane is good out to here. Obviously, nobody wants to actually personally fly an airplane out to this speed if the flutter analysis doesn't show you're better to some fire speed to give you a margin. So this is the kind of thing that ends up happening. You've analyzed to here, you flight test to here, and the customers can all fly out to here. And that's uh, an example of the layer of safety that you get from, from that analysis. So I'll talk just for a minute. This is basically the overall slide about what the aeroelastic analysis requirements look like for design and certification and, and uh, you know, straight, you know, just at the highest level again, you know, the aircraft loads are the forces that balance the airplane and the flight conditions you have to have. So you've got the air pressure loads uh, typically holding the airplane up and, uh, of course, producing some drag. You've got inertia forces from gravity or from accelerations if you're maneuvering. Thrust loads, you've got ground loads if you're hitting the ground. So these are all the kind of uh, loads you put together into all these kind of conditions, static, dynamic, ground, and flight loads. The internal loads that come from that. These same forces get counted for uh, for the uh, unsteady uh, flutter calculations, fatigue and damage tolerance. All of these things are what get calculated, and they all have to be done with an, an aeroelastic model. So to do that, you have to know what the air pressure and inertia forces are at all the all the uh, conditions that you're looking to calculate. You have to cover all the flight and ground conditions for again speeds and altitudes, like I showed before. You may have different, well, you will have different flat positions for any airplane with the trailing edge device, different weights and centers of gravity. You have to show that for all these conditions in the flight envelope, that the airplane uh, is is designed and safe. So you have to calculate what to design the strength to, and you have to show the uh, stability to there. And what I've shown over here on the right is uh, is another representation for design. This is now the load factor. So the airplane uh, uh, overall G level, 1G steady flight is here, and here's the speed. And now you have uh, uh, the highest load factor you designed to, the lowest load factor, uh, the, the maneuvering line for the maximum lift, uh, up, to, uh, up to a maneuvering speed at A, the cruise speed at C, a dive speed at D, and this, and then down to the negative uh, uh, load factors. So this whole area gets covered. Typically, you're calculating pieces on the corner uh, to calculate strength loads, and then fatigue loads come in mission conditions that are going to be on this 1G line.
and for all that work, you have to, uh, of course, design the airplane and come up with uh, with uh, design criteria. And this is really the fundamental reason you hit one of the fundamental reasons, actually. I think there's basically two, that you have uh, cycles in your design. And one of them is that this is a, a, a solution that depends upon each other. You can't solve this in closed form from first principles, so you end up with an iterative solution uh, reaching for your design. So when, uh, I'm showing kind of two loops here. Uh, one's an outer loop where you're actually trying different designs, trying to meet your requirements. Uh, and then either certify and build, or if you're not there yet, go back into new designs. Then on this inner loop, you're just closing the design. Uh, you have aerodynamics that feed the loads and flutter, which are also fed by mass and stiffness data. And those data come from the loads, from the structures and stress, and the weights and systems. And then you meet the performance you want, which gets back into your aerodynamics. So you can see there's a, a cycle here of, uh, of closing with everybody. Uh, not just uh, the loads and flutter guy that I'm mostly talking about here today, but everybody else as well. And inside that loop, everybody has to make assumptions to begin with about their data and what that what that means to to close a model. So you always end up with uh, you know, lower fidelity data at the start of a project, and as you're developing data, you go through more loops where you get feedback from the people that take your data and use it, or the people upstream of you that have taken those results and made an update. And, and update that data. And so one point that, that uh, I especially make a lot, uh, I know when I was a student, this wasn't so obvious to me, so especially when I'm at a university, that uh, revision and data source control are really, really important because uh, I'll show in a minute, you'll probably have about four major updates to this kind of work, and there'll be numerous minor updates. So it's not at all unusual to have you know, dozens of revisions of data, and you need to be able to keep track of where they came from and what fidelity they were and, and what stage in the process you're at. Here I'm showing the uh, typical uh, releases that happen in, a, in, a, in the major analysis cycles for these civil programs. There's usually about four of them, and they tend to have been codified here uh, uh, in, in North America with these four names, a lot of times they just get numbered uh, the, uh, you know, loop 1234 or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 with subloops. And, and obviously this isn't a requirement that there's four and you call them this, but this is uh, typically the about the kind of level you have. Uh, and at the PD level, you're really trying to do rapid trains and you're trying to, uh, to um, come up with uh, make overall design decisions and trends and understand the basics of what's going out that you're getting at there and really do your initial sizing. So you need something that doesn't take a lot of input data, that runs quickly, that gives you basic trends and overall ideas. And to get that, you, you, you uh, make the trade-off of not having a lot of detailed data and not taking a lot of time and effort to generate a lot of detailed data, especially on configurations that maybe you're not even going to use later. So you, you go very quickly. When you move up to our preliminary design, uh, then you're looking at um, having some higher order data uh, on the aerodynamic side, maybe some uh, CFD data, maybe even some wind tunnel data at that point. Uh, obviously, this could move around depending on different projects. Uh, you may have some FEM work there. And here you're really trying to identify real critical conditions, whether it's for structure or for the critical flutter conditions for how you're going to make sure you clear the airplane, uh, the things that are really going to drive the design so you can go refine what you have there. Uh, a third level that you usually end up with is a is then is a design two level, uh, where that data is again got some increased fidelity with some kind of uh, analytical backing on it at this point, probably some wind tunnel testing to verify some aerodynamics and go along with uh, probably a lot more CFD, especially today as the CFD does so much more. On the structural side, you'll have some testing or some some good good solid validation on what you have there. Uh, and it's interesting, the certification data is the final one that goes to the, the, you know, the FAA or the certification authority to show that your data all meet the requirements and all result in a safe airplane. But that's going to come along with the very end of the program and get proven by ultimately flight tests and other tests on the as-built article. The article that's built had to be designed to something earlier, and so the, uh, the um, uh, excuse me, the uh, data that's going to actually design the airplane uh, is really coming from the design two data, which is kind of interesting. The structure is actually built to those, and the final ones just show that those were all right. Um, I've got a couple of questions I see here coming up as well. Uh, panel methods, 
may come in the very beginning, they may come later, uh, depending a little bit on what you call a panel method. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, uh, double lattice and vortex lattice are literally panel methods, but uh, usually those are always used immediately and usually carried all the way through, especially for dynamics. Uh, 3D panel methods, they might get used right away. They might be more in the PD. It really depends on each company's process for how how easily they can use that data and how quickly they make them happen. Um, also, by the way, I do have some uh, some flutter data to show here from uh, some butterfly tests later in the presentation, so we'll make sure we get onto that. And uh, and I see uh, Nastran doing vibration flutter. Absolutely, Nastran uh, does structural vibration as a, a fundamental part of its uh, uh, mass imaging properties work, and then the uh, flutter gets into there as well. Flutter due to noise. I have never personally seen that done directly. Um, uh, that's not something that we have get involved in here, so that's uh, it's not one I don't have covered in this in this presentation. Okay, so moving along from here, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the kinds of modeling you typically see in these four different sets, and then have a uh, have uh, some samples here coming after that. So for product development, like I say, you're looking at really minimalistic uh, input data. You're looking to, to go as fast as you, as you can and come up with basic trends and not necessarily spend a tremendous amount of time refining data for something that you might not carry forward. So you're going to have the very simplest aerodynamic models, which are typically going to be a double lattice model, uh, maybe even a lifting line model, depending on the, where you're working and what they have available. Uh, the, the, the structure will almost certainly be idealized beams. Um, one exception might be if you have a, uh, if it's a sub-model of something you've already done and you already have a tremendous amount of data, maybe it's easier to build on that. But you're going to start with something that works really simply. And you're going to look at a small subset of cases or conditions. Uh, you've got, you know, you're, you've got past experience usually in similar projects. Uh, you maybe have some simpler predictions for what the critical conditions are. Uh, you're not going to look at, you know, thousands and thousands of conditions. Uh, you'll look more maybe at hundreds or, or, or dozens even. And the reason for that is to get a rapid turnaround to make sure that you can uh, that you can uh, get things going and working fast. I see someone uh, maybe isn't hearing me properly. Let me know here again if that continues to be a problem. Hopefully this is fine. Uh, you'll have a pretty simple structural model. Here's a sample of what one of those might look like. This is. Uh, uh, this is a sample from an old old mentor of mine, so it's not a project I personally worked on, and I uh, can't even tell you what it is. I probably couldn't tell you if I knew. But in any event, uh, what you can see here, I'll talk about it a little bit. This is a simple beam model, and uh, so the beams themselves are going between these nodes, and so these have simple beam properties that, that represent the overall structural uh, response for this whole section. Same here out here on the wing. And that really constitutes the actual structural model. So if I didn't show any of these other pieces of details, it'd be even simpler. It really would just look like sticks. Uh, and what's happened here is there's some uh, some uh, non-structural elements that have been put on here uh, as outline pieces. You can see them at the top and the bottom of the fuselage. And you can see them down the leading edge of the wing and the trailing edge of the wing. And that allows you to visualize better the structural motion from those beams. You can't really see torsional motion of the beam. Uh, and also, it allows you to more easily spline the aerodynamics from the aerodynamic model into this piece. Uh, uh, you can use a beam spline and not have to have these, but you do need them for visualization. So our experience has been it, it makes more sense to use the uh, plate splines, and it, it gives us more control over the splining, and at the same time uh, allows us to visualize these structural motions. Uh, because it's an equivalent beam, there really isn't a mass property that it makes sense to put into the beam, because there really isn't a beam that looks like that on the airplane, right? This is an idealization. So instead of having a density on the beam, you'll typically have a massless beam and a stiffness model only, and then you put in uh, lump masses at the individual points to represent the mass distribution. And so that means you do need to discretize the stiffness and the mass in a way that, that makes sense for the problem you're doing. Uh, it needs to be fine enough that you can get a good enough representation of either a distribution of load or of a dynamic property, uh, and, it and it needs to be uh, 
that will usually drive it to be a little finer distribution. And then what drives it to be a less fine distribution is simply how large of a model you want to run. Here in the, in the beginning section, you want a pretty easy model and make it pretty simple. In this particular model, there's also some, some uh, uh, different control systems set up, uh, looking down the road a little bit for doing some <clears throat> excuse me, control system variation. So you can see some uh, con uh, coordinate directions for showing which way those controls go and which way different uh, loads may come out. There's also a little bit of work here where the uh, engine nacelle is to get those aerodynamic forces put out onto the nacelle. For a simple aerodynamic model, you'll probably have something uh, just, as, just as simple as, uh, as this here. Uh, this is a, a double lattice uh, uh, wing, so you've got a leading edge and trailing, or sorry, a, a <laughs> leading edge and trailing edge for the inboard and outboard section, and you may have something set up to allow you to deflect some control panels, so you can have a, a you know a control surface or flap or what have you there, and that's going to be spline back and forth the structural model, and uh, about the simplest model you can make. Uh, you may not have any kind of test data of any kind, so you may have entirely theoretical data going in here. Maybe you have some related test data from similar models or past experience or general work that you can put in there. But the focus really is on quick changes and making it be able to go fast and make overall program decisions. If you move on to what happens in preliminary design, what you're trying to really do there is, is bound the envelope. Uh, what I've put on over here on the right is uh, is really a, a cartoon of what a typical envelope might look like, for example, for a wing load. So if you had an inboard and an outboard wing, and if you imagine you were calculating up the, the shear or the bending moment from zero at the tip to some number at the root for a whole bunch of different conditions, what you're really interested in are the maximum conditions that you're going to have to design to, which would be around here. So. In the PD world, you're still not really going to uh, get every single case in there, most likely. But uh, you're going to want to take the data that you know, the experience that you have, and your sensitivities to try to figure out what the trends are, what the critical conditions are, and, and what you're working on there. And so again, you're probably going to have a double lattice model. You'll probably scale it to CFD at this point. Maybe you'll have some wind tunnel model. Uh, one thing you might do here is use direct pressure inputs, which we can I'll talk about a little bit more later, where you can uh, go ahead and put pressures directly on mass strand panels as opposed to using the doublet or uh, vortex lattice that's within mass strand code, uh, which is something we do uh, quite a bit here and we found works really well. You know, you're, uh, you'll have your probably an idealized beam, maybe you'll have frame results to update it, maybe even some frame results as you go on and work on that. And I think I have a picture or two here for what that what that looks like. So here's a model that really isn't a lot more complicated than before, but it's a little bit more. And uh, I'll have a couple other pictures coming up. So here's one where, again, you've got idealized beams, and you've got leading edges and trailing edges. And then the one thing that's really changed is you've put in a number of positions that have to do with uh, potential test locations. And so instead of just having a leading edge and a trailing edge, you've got a front and a rear spar. And so now you can start getting, it's not modeled as structure, excuse me, but modeled as points in here. And so now you can get data out at spar locations. Uh, there's some more detail on where a control system actually is and, and an aileron here. And so the, the aileron, and I'm sorry, with these uh, nodes, you can't quite see the additional lines for structure here, but there's additional beams here for an aileron that's hooked up. And so now you've got uh, different locations that even though this really is a rigid beam across, you do have different points to get data out. And one thing that does for you is help you with testing in the future. So if you are going to go do a, a GVT, for example, to get vibration points or a static load test or both, you actually have points that record points on your model that correspond to points on your physical airplane so that when you do that testing, it's a lot easier to correlate the pieces together and, uh, and show what you have there. You can see on the empennage as well here, the control service has been shaken out of a separate piece of structure as well as, as the rudder here. Um, you may be moving up to a, to a larger double lattice model that has more features. Here's one uh, representative kind of model. Uh, in this case, the, the flying services are all double lattice panels, and the fuselage is being represented as interference and in lifting bodies here. So there's a or excuse me, interference and uh, slender bodies. So there's uh, interference slender body here uh, with uh, 
with a lifting surface intersecting that and it does not go to center line. The lift carryover is coming through the, uh, the slender body here and the interference body. And this lifting surface comes out all the way to the tip. You can see a representation of pylons and of the cells. Uh, and then in the back end, you also have uh, the, the stabilizing surf lifting surfaces and another interference and slender body back here for putting these together. Um, you often see in a, in a flutter model where the slender bodies are actually separated like this so that you don't have a full uh, aerodynamic fuselage carry on because uh, for the aeroelastic stability for flutter, there's very little effect of that. Uh, for a loads model, you would typically see these connected, have one piece, so you have a continuous uh, air load carryover. Um, one reason you would do it this way that's in front of us here for Flutter is that it's a little bit more of a challenge to make one body that matches all these interference points on the pieces, and so this is a little faster to make. Uh, on, if you're doing a dynamic loads model, you would end up having to do a little more work to come up with a slender body that, that meets these requirements. Or you may move to a, uh, a more full 3D uh, panel representation of the airplane at some point as well. And then moving on to a, a design to analysis, where you're actually going to build the structure to these loads. Uh, at this point, the expectation is you're going to have a, a significant amount of test data now that you can start rolling in. And of course, like I mentioned before, this is uh, what kind of an overall flavor of what happens. Uh, test data gets rolled in as soon as it's available. Data gets rolled in when it can. So uh, people aren't necessarily sitting on data waiting to, to use it at a stage like this. But by this stage, you're expecting to have enough data that you can come up with a, a set of loads and a set of expectations for elastic stability, aerodynamic stability, overall performance, really everything that uh, the airplane will be expected to meet its mission and uh, meet its structural margins based on what comes out of here. And so you're probably going to use quite a bit of direct force and pressure inputs, uh, probably a lot of things that you're not going to get out of a, out of a double lattice but put straight in, uh, and a structural model that is at the level of fidelity that you need to get the results that you're looking for. Um, and so things that are really critical results where they're very sensitive to the modeling, you're going to have to really focus in on that modeling and make sure that it's representing everything properly. Areas that aren't very sensitive, and that may be a wing, a wing box, that kind of area. Areas that aren't very sensitive, you know, like maybe a fuselage or a fuselage that uh, isn't, or it's air where its stiffness properties aren't driving very much, you might not have as much uh, there as you might as you as you would in other areas of the airplane. And here you are going to be looking at uh, large numbers of cases to make sure you're not missing any, because the next step is going to be to go show that you match all the cases. So in fact, at this point, you may be running all the conditions that you need to for certification, but just with uh, the, the best data set you have at the time. Uh, over here on the right, on this particular picture, I thought I'd talk about this just a little bit. Uh, what this is is a CFD calculation for a particular airplane uh, with spoilers deployed. And this is one of those uh, conditions, you know, spoilers, of course, you know, produce a uh, produce a lot of drag, that's their goal in life. And uh, they also significantly reduce the lift over the section they're on and make a pitching moment change. There's a lot of separated flow behind these, and this has traditionally been a very difficult area to, to get reliable CFD data for actual numerical effects. You know, how, how much does the lift change? How much does the pitching moment change? Um, and this is a really exciting thing for me in my career that you know, when I started, this is not something you could even think about doing numerically and get results you could really stand behind. And that's really changed. You can get a lot of great data now. You ultimately have to validate it with tests, but you do get a lot of data you can use. So here's one particular sample of a calculation for that uh, in the CFD world. And now if you have a, a model that you need to apply that to, you need to find a way to put this in your aeroelastic model. And uh, that's, again, where the uh, master and capability of putting pressures directly on panels is really helpful. Uh, if you look at that kind of pressure distribution for the spoilers, and you can see you know, here's, a, here's a higher velocity in relative suction. Here's lower velocity in relative pressure. There really isn't a way to get a double lattice formulation to give this kind of change of lift in a, in a way that, that's reliable and makes sense. And so being able to just directly put in pressures on those panels associated with the spoiler, basically creating a trim variable that, uh, 
that's related to that spoiler deflection and putting that right in uh, is really a terrific way to go. And and that doesn't have to be the same paneling that's used for double lattice. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about this more in a minute. But it allows you to uh, to uh, put that in directly on a 3D geometry or a 2D geometry. And that's exactly what I just was talking about a minute here ago about full aerodynamic calculation. Double lattice models obviously don't calculate all the physics of the flow field, so they're going to get a close answer but not an exact answer. And that's essentially true for any calculation that you're going to make. They get to be higher fidelity, but there's still some kind of adjustment you have to make, either from a higher order method or wind tunnel or flight test that you finally validate in flight. And I'll show a couple of general examples of this on the next couple of slides here. Uh, one here would be for a distributed wing lift. So this is uh, running out the span of the wing from the root out to the tip. And then this would be the uh, lift curve slope, local lift curve slope per radian, uh, loading slope actually based on uh, average cord. And you can see where a double lattice might give you an example that looks like this. Uh, but you know the actual airplane from your data. This one's the original loads data, but it might be from wind tunnel CFD wherever. Is it points like this, and you can see that the uh, lattice gets you close, but doesn't quite get it there. Uh, in the case of transonics, it's pretty typical for there to be an overall shift, you know, a certain percentage difference, and then local body interference effects are often different as well. And so what you end up doing is coming up with some kind of scaling of your double lattice to take you from the solution that you get to the solution that is a higher order data. So here's an example where a matching has been done in lift. I can move on to show you a similar thing again for a pitching moment. In this case, the pitching moment, the local sectional pitching moment on the wing is being shown by saying where the aerodynamic center is, which in 2D theory is right at the 25% cord line. So you can see the theoretical data gets you right along there. There's a forward shift to the center of pressure close to the, the root, which is typical for a swept wing. And there's some aft shifts out, which is also typical. And you can see where the lattice, we give you an example like this. And then your higher order or test data gives you a location like this. So you come up with a, a scaling that uh, gives you both the change in lift and moment that you're looking for. And finally, I'll mention uh, along that line, and this is especially important for, um, for uh, uh, flutter work, is that uh, control service hinge moments are very much over predicted by basically all potential flow methods, and especially the lattice method, basically usually about the order of two. And the control service hinge moment is a large driver in any control-related uh, flutter work. And so you always have to have more data to, to justify the number that you're using there. And one of the large numbers you do a sensitivity on is, um, is uh, what that hinge moment value actually is, since it's also hard to, to know for sure what it is. Uh, there's one little example here that's out of a, a Journal of Aircraft report. I believe this was an Australian airplane incident. Uh, where they actually had a, had flutter on a, on a fairly light airplane with uh, manual controls. And they had done their calculation with 100% hinge moment, which is actually damping. I can show on this line, this is velocity and damping. Uh, this is stable, this is unstable. So flutter is happening here. Their prediction was this 100% line, which of course looks good. And as you reduce the hinge moment to lower values, you can see less and less stability until you get a, a hump mode, which actually shows a, flutter starting at a speed, and it's stabilizing at a higher speed. And this is uh, what actually happened to them in tests. They got some flutter going up here and stopped down here, showing that the actual hinge moment is probably somewhere in, in this range. So then on the certification data, which, which really ends up being an update to the Design 2 data, because at the Design 2 point, you probably have, you're expecting to have everything you're designed to save airplane to. So really, for your certification data, there's about three things you do with it. And uh, one of those is, of course, to give to the uh, certification authorities to show that the airplane meets all the rules and is safe. Another interesting one is usually you're done by that time to be able to provide the flight test safety clearance. So you can show that the airplane's you know, safe to fly, uh, what conditions you want to go fly to first, how to carefully expand the model, and how to show that that works. And, um, your aerodynamic model, you're going to validate by your flight loads survey, which will have pressures and strains. Uh, your structural model, actually before you go fly, will be validated by GVT and static test. And you're going to have to show, of course, the loads to be accurate or conservative, uh, which typically involves having a, a set of predicted loads 
for the flight test places that you actually, flight test conditions that you actually fly and comparing those to the actual loads that you go measure. You, you don't go fly, I think I have this on the slide coming up, but you don't go fly uh, uh, critical conditions, uh, the ones that were predicted to actually be critical for the structure. You don't, you don't want to go all the way to where the structure was uh, designed to. Uh, just for general safety, the FAA actually uh, doesn't require you to do that. In fact, strongly uh, encourages you, almost requires you, if I might say not to, uh, you're typically flying to no more than 80% of that uh, to give yourself some margin of safety. And so you're really validating your full model by, by uh, flying other related conditions that are similar to the critical ones, but not all the way, maybe not the full load factor, maybe not quite the full speed if it's a, if it's a high, high speed flutter case, but getting close enough to show that your basic predictive model worked. Like I said, I think I have a little, I, I know I have a little more on that here in a minute. Uh, here's an example of a full FEM structural model that, again, you might have at the very beginning of the project if you're starting that way, but usually comes along a little later. Uh, even this one is a fairly coarse FEM, as a stress guy would say, because you're not maybe going to get uh, local detailed stresses out of it, but you will get overall airplane loads to a nice distribution. That particular one, I believe, is an idealization where every spar and stringer and bulkhead and frame intersection has a point, and so there are uh, uh, pieces of things on there. Hmm. I'll talk a little bit here. This is a uh, a chart for the kind of level of work that got done for, for three typical programs, uh, representative programs uh, uh, seen for the modeling. You can see this is a, while the stiffness and the mass and the static aerodynamics were done for each one of these airplanes. Uh, one example is a business jet that had a full FEM with, uh, again, rib and stringer intersections and, uh, and uh, uh, bulkhead and fuselage intersections, C-bars and quad panels between them. Uh, in that case, the, uh, the, the FEM still had zero mass in it, no stiffness, uh, excuse me, all stiffness and no, in, no, uh, no densities, uh, and all the, but, but all the uh, distributed masses were distributed to the local node level, so it was a pretty fine distribution. Every node had a piece of uh, mass associated with it. And then uh, the static aerodynamics were put in, again, as pressures directly on panels rather than uh, uh, through the double lattice. In all three of these cases, the dynamic aerodynamics came from double lattice, uh, which is a, a fundamental requirement of, of MSG Nastran dynamic aeroelasticity, so I'm not listing that here. Uh, another example is a transport airplane work where the uh, 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 model was a beam model for the most part with some stiffness matrix additions for some parts of the structure that uh, couldn't really be adequately represented by an idealized beam, either a low aspect ratio or an intersection or something like that, but still quite a lot of beam models. I think it might surprise people sometimes how much beam models are still used, but they are quite, uh, quite effective and, of course, run fast. Again, a lumped mass representation, so the mass is discretized to a, a piece appropriate there. And, um, and finally, pressure is put in again by static pressures as they go together. And my, my third example here, a commuter airplane. Uh, that, that we did a, a piece of certification work on where, in this case, a little bit interesting, you don't see this that often, uh, the entire structure was idealized as, as the stiffness and mass matrix. So there wasn't, uh, in the downstream data that we had, and this was legacy data from an OEM that was no longer in business, uh, the original FEM had been taken and a mass matrix had been put out from it, a mass and stiffness matrix, which were both used downstream. So there was no longer any higher level idealization of the structure whatsoever. No beams, no quads, no nothing. Uh, simply mass and stiffness matrices with, again, lump mass to add payload and fuel and changeable masses. And in that case, we did have the, uh, the uh, double lattice for the aerodynamics with some corrections uh, rather than the static pressures being put on. Uh, moving along here a little, I've, uh, I've talked a little bit about some of these uh, important aerodynamic features, and I do want to show that uh, some of that test stuff, so let me not talk about these a lot, but because uh, I think these were covered in the presentation overall uh, last month. But putting the aerodynamic data on directly on the aerodynamic or structural message is really an important way to get all these effects that you can't capture well on a lattice. Uh, being able to put in your own user variables is important so you can get gearing and spoilers and all your other work and nonlinear pieces. 
And being able to put in these pressures, you have one thing you have to have is a separate rigid and flex flexible mesh, which we use here all the time. That allows you, again, to separate your aerodynamics from rigid and static. You can have totally separate rigid and static models if you want. So you can have a rigid CFD pressure input that comes right into the model and a double lattice elastic correction, which is really handy. Uh, we make great use of the monitor points here. Uh, which allows you to arbitrarily sum up your forces and for fan-based calculations, you pretty much have to have them uh, or else you're going to have to do it all in some kind of post-processor to get those local loads added up. We do a lot of reuse of aerodynamic databases because that's the uh, piece of calculation that takes a while. So we can uh, just do that once and then reuse it. And then also we can make sure that we look at it over carefully, make sure it's working, and then go put those files away. And that does help us uh, help us be consistent and avoid uh, errors doing work over and over again. And we do an awful lot of work on the restarts here. <clears throat> In the tune discrete F calculation, you're typically looking at uh, some number, maybe 10 or 15 individual gust lengths. Uh, at every given point in the sky. And the expensive part of that calculation is getting the response parameters. Putting the input in and getting the output is, is not as expensive. So you don't want to repeat that calculation 10 times for every point in the sky. So we make extensive use of restart for that work and for other pieces of work as well, trying to speed up that process. Let me talk a little bit about validation here. I said you had to validate uh, all the work that you have, all the data that you have. So this is that classic air elasticity triangle. I think this might be Rodin's version of it. Uh, but again, you have dynamics from inertial forces, structural mechanics from the elastic forces, and aerodynamic forces in the, for the, from the fluid. And they all add up to give you vibrations, static air elasticity, aerodynamic stability, including uh, deflections, and uh, the air elasticity here in the middle. If I move on to the next slide, I've put on here how these are typically validated. On the ground, you can just measure all your mass properties and, of course, predict them pretty well before you even get there. And uh, that direct measurement is the way you're going to validate most of this. On the stiffness side, there are two things you do. You can do static load work and get directly at your stiffnesses. Uh, and with the GVT, put your stiffness and mass together. GVTs are pretty interesting because you're measuring vibration frequencies. And, of course, that's a combination of the mass and the stiffness. Typically, you know the mass to much higher fidelity than you know the stiffness. So we often speak of the GVT as giving you the stiffness data. It really gives you the combined data. But because you know your mass usually much better, you're really tuning up your stiffness typically to, uh, to get your model to match the test data there. And then all the rest of this is going to come from flight test. In flight test, you're going to have uh, uh, pressure belts to help validate your, your aerodynamic data. Uh, for your basic aerodynamic data, but of course you're taking it on the flexible airplanes, so you're validating your static air elasticity at the same time. Uh, you're going to do separate tests for aero stability and handling qualities, which comes over here, and you're going to be getting uh, your overall uh, flutter test and any other dynamic tests here kind of out of the middle. As I mentioned before, in flight testing, you're not going to fly the airplane to critical loads and flutter conditions. You're going to use other similar conditions, so for example, the critical payload at the critical point in the sky, but instead of two and a half or whatever G level, you're going to fly to two. In fact, you won't, won't fly to just that one point. What you're going to do is fly trends and show that you get the right trends. So you might fly a half a G, one G, one and a half Gs, two Gs, and then go plot all that up and show that it gives you the correct slope uh, with load factor that your model predicted, as well as load levels that are equal to or higher, or excuse me, that your model gives you equal to or higher loads compared to your test data. Um, you know, because you can't go fly to the actual conditions, you have to validate that the model gives you the correct predictions overall, and you do that by showing trends and, and results near to those critical cases, either with pressures or strains for the, uh, for the uh, loads work. And then for the flutter work, as I kind of showed before, and I have a slide coming up to, to repeat that again, you're not going to go out and fly to where the airplane flutters. That's not the idea. In fact, we often don't call it a flutter flight test. We call it a freedom from flutter flight test, because that's what we're trying to show. And so you're going to go off and, and show that in the flight envelope, you don't have any undamped un, uh, behavior or low damping, and basically that you didn't miss anything, and that your damping conditions are similar to what you predicted, and, uh, and showing something safe. And for you know, failure conditions drive a lot of design and a lot of analysis. And obviously, you're not going to go deliberately fail structure on an airplane and fly it. But you might fly some hydraulic uh, reversion cases for some hydraulic failures or other conditions like that that are easily controlled in flight and easily shown to be done. And 
going back to the same model here, our same uh, uh, envelope here where I showed before, where you might have a cruise uh, envelope and a dive envelope and then a, a freedom from flutter envelope. Again, here's a cartoon situation where maybe the airplane critical flutter boundary was here, showing that flutter happens here, but it doesn't happen on this side. So you met the legal, the regulatory requirements to clear this point. And then this might be the boundary of low damping, uh, which is allowed to be inside here, but not inside the dive speed. And what you might be doing is doing a buildup of speeds from low to high at a high Mach number, a low dynamic pressure, at a high speed, a low Mach number, and finally at a critical point uh, to show uh, freedom from flutter in all these areas. And so you can see you've predicted you're free out to here, you're going to test out to here, and normal operations are going to be limited to here. I do have a couple of different samples of what some of that output might look like um, that I get to show here. Uh, here's an example of a, a rudder kick in a flutter flight test. So what you're doing is putting in a rudder pulse to excite uh, lateral modes in the, in the tail and the fuselage, and the, air, well, the airplane overall, usually critical for the tail and the aft fuselage. This case is a uh, uh, happens to be a T-tail airplane. So on the top, you can see the, the, the actual rudder input being made, and then this is the rudder free return. And then here's a, here's a vertical uh, a tail accelerometer being excited, and then here's a horizontal stabilizer up on the top. And here you can see pretty clearly that uh, you know there's a nice structural response measured. You can see that it's well damped. Uh, you know you could go calculate the frequency on this. If you're in the airplane in real time deciding if this is safe or not, this is a pretty easy call. Everything dies down pretty quickly. Everything's uh, pretty clearly uh, well behaved. Here's another sample where you might be, uh, this is an elevator. So here again is the, the elevator. You can see it's got some more uh, uh, dynamics on its way back down. The initial input stopped here. And, and this is the elevator return and overshoot. And here you've got uh, horizontal stabilizer accelerations and uh, some wing accelerations. Here it might be a little harder to decide that things are stable damping, but actually you can, a lot of noise here, and you can work on this later uh, uh, for your final work, but in, the, in flight on the airplane, you've got to kind of watch this and decide that this is uh, damped down pretty well, which again, you can see that it is. I've got another example that's a little harder to be very sure about. Uh, this is an elevator and stabilizer, uh, again, for another, another kind of input. Uh, it's a much higher speed. There's a lot of vibration on the airplane overall, and so you know there's actually an input being made here, uh, right around here, and it's pretty hard to tell uh, what's going on there. Uh, this, by the way, is a pullout after the dive that's happening here. So here's the dynamics of the input, and here's some static uh, air elasticity as you're pulling out. That's pretty hard to tell what's going on there. You pretty much have to go to frequency analysis. And I've got one example to show for that, where you take that, uh, this is not taken from that same piece of data, but you take some data like that and get a PSD of it. So now you've got a frequency space and a magnitude of a particular response. And you can see one peak here, some other work, and then the major peak of the major structural response. What's happened here is a single degree of freedom fit to this basic shape, and you can get the damping from the single degree of freedom fit. That's not something you can typically do in, in real time, although you can do it in near real time if you're set up for it. But uh, certainly later you can come back and, and show that damping. Uh, that's uh, the end of, I think, all the slides I have here. Uh, again, you know, the main thing with air elastics is the whole airframe analysis. It takes data from different disciplines. And you can see that for actual certifying airplanes, you have to start very simply and quick, and then you have to get to be very detailed and your validated results, and, and as I mentioned before, the uh, civil airworthiness requirements are that the airplane's safe, so there's a lot of high validation requirements to, to keep that safe and working. And with that, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. 